Pricing for APIs, it's not an easy thing, but it's important in many cases. And today we'll talk about the evolution of pricing models, a case study of a specific API product. And with me is Derek Gilling of Mosif. Hey, Derek, thanks for joining. How are you doing? Doing good. Thanks, for uh, Eric, for uh, having us on the show today. Yeah, well, thanks for being back. Um, it's really good to talk about this. So, so when we met recently, you talked about that you adjusted the pricing of uh, Mosif. And I found that interesting because we see that pricing is important. We see that companies are evolving their pricing models um, over time. So let's start by discussing how your pricing strategy changed over time and, and what, what caused your, those changes to happen. Definitely. So um, just for context, uh, we're out now on our third iteration or version of, of pricing for MOSEF. Our first version was uh, what you consider like your typical tiered pricing with a fixed quota. Then we moved to, uh, I guess, a pseudo usage-based pricing model. And now the most recent is, is really full usage-based with the commitment uh, uh, a point. And when we look at our how we charge itself, there's really two things we, we price on. One is event volume, because most of it is an analytics tool for APIs. And so we charge on how many different events are being logged to the platform. In addition, we charge on how many different authenticated users are logging in. These are team members from you know your company. Um, you know, is it five team members, is it 10 team members, 50 team members? And so those are really the two different components there. Um, when we first got started, you know, we had a very simple, you know, three different tiers. We had a, a grow tier, which was a hundred bucks a month, then a, a pro tier, which is 550 a month, and then enterprise tiers. Each one of those had a very specific quota and number of uh, users that you get. And as soon as you go beyond that quota, you're basically locked out of your account because you, know, you would get a paywall um, and you'd have to upgrade. And so that customer experience was less than ideal. Now, granted, it's very complex and hard to do use space pricing. So that's why we went down that path initially. But, you know, that's when we started thinking about, okay, how do we actually improve the customer experience? So customers are not locked out of their account just because, you know, they went, you know, one event over their, their quota itself. Mm -hmm. And just to give me viewers just a little idea of what's happening, right? So you said, yes, yeah, and it's an analytics platform. So, so in your case, the numbers are, like typical numbers, a couple hundred thousand, couple million events per month, right? These are the numbers that you would typically um, deal with or users would typically deal with when they use Mosif. And, and that's actually one of the tricky things for, you know, any type of analytics platform. Um, you know, we had a very, very wide range of customers. You know, some customers would be sending, you know, maybe it's a couple 10,000 events or a couple million. But we'd have other customers that, you know, would be in hundreds of millions and, and billions of event calls. Of course, that would be more of an enterprise discussion. When we look at just the self-service alone, which is what we, you know, uh, are revamped here, uh, the the grow plan, which was our first paid plan, that was a million events for for hundred bucks a month, and then we had a pro plan, which was five hundred fifty a month, and that would include five million events, and then anything beyond that, you know, uh, on our first iteration of pricing, you'd have to upgrade to enterprise but not everyone was ready to upgrade to enterprise. So that was a, a, a contention area that we saw, right? Because our, our enterprise pricing was, was starting at a higher amount, but then that pro plan was only 550 a month. So about in the end of 2021 or around 2021, we introduced this concept of overage fee, right? And so what that enabled our customers to do is instead of getting locked out of their account if they go over their plan quota, they could just pay um, there, there was this fixed amount, which was $2.25 per 10,000 events in overage fees. Now, this had it helped reduce some of the issues we saw initially. You know, now they're not locked out of their account. They can continue to get value out of most of, you know, especially if they need to uh, troubleshoot a customer issue or get those reports really quickly. You know, they don't have to worry about asking their manager or, or get approval to change their plan. Now, the downside there, though, is it actually felt like you're penalized by using most of more because you would actually get this overage fee, which could be actually quite expensive. Two dollars and twenty-five cents, you know, for for ten k events was actually quite high, right? And so 
that was actually one of the biggest drivers for us to redo our pricing again so we can uh, encourage customers to get more value out of most of use most of instead of actually penalizing them for additional usage and again to some extent right it's also just the uh, psychology of calling it overage fee right because in the end you you want people to use most of more right and then if if they do it you charge an overage fee that kind of like is is not the right incentive i guess right it's not just just from a customer management perspective i guess it's not really the the feeling that you want to create with with your customers indeed in, in fact you know we want to be you know supportive for whatever usage you know a, a, a product might have and you know sometimes you know if, if you're very early in your product life cycle you don't need a lot of usage you're just getting started nor do you even know what that usage is going to be right because you're still trying to figure things out you're getting first customers and then over time, you know, after after a new API is out in the wild for six months or 12 months or, or whatever it is, you have a much better understanding of, you know, what your typical volume requirements are. And so we took a page out of, uh, you know, Amazon with AWS and, and Azure in the way that they did reserved instance pricing, right? And so with the latest pricing we just released, now you can either do pay as you go or you can commit to a certain band. Or a certain amount of events and those different bands are very fine grained so each step up it's you know 300k events or 500k events or 1 million events depending on you know where it is within um the, the amount and so if you're a, a brand new customer have no idea what your usage is you can just get started and and go to the minimum amount of commitment and then whatever your your month is that's what you pay you know just like your your cell phone bill um, you can, you're just basically paying per event or per minute. Um, Twilio does something very similar. You're paying per, per text message, right? And this allows customers who are, some months might be very high because they're going into, you know, the uh, holiday season, or maybe it's because they're going to political season, um, because they're maybe like a communications platform. Um, and so they can actually ramp up and ramp down very easily without worrying about the commitment. But for us, for capacity planning, you know, it is cheaper and easier for us to manage, you know, if a customer wants to commit to a certain amount. And so they can commit to a monthly amount or an annual amount, depending on, you know, how much discounting they want. And this is a way for us to, you know, encourage our customers to use most and more. They get a discount and that discount increases each time they, they step up that commitment level, right? And so if they realize maybe I, I am hovering around seven and a half million events per month, I can commit to that band and I get a respective discount for committing to that amount, but then I can still do, do, you know, if, if it's actually 8 million, I can do the rest as pay as you go. Right. So I'm not penalized because I'm not getting any overage fees, but I do get that discount um, by committing more to most of. Okay. So I think that's a really interesting story. So right, how this evolved over time from a very kind of very fixed and then, like a little bit more flexible, but with these overage fees, putting in the right, uh, the, not the right incentives. And now you have a much more flexible model that probably creates much, much better incentives for your customers. Now, let's briefly talk about how that might translate or how that is applicable for others who might also look into API pricing, how to create a pricing model that works for them and for their customers. So let's talk a little bit about the the path that you followed or the method you applied so that you came up with this evolution of your pricing model? So there's a couple uh, key objectives we had with this pricing model. Number one is we wanted to actually reduce the complexity of the plans themselves. Um, before we had this grow plan, we had this pro plan, the feature uh, um, or what, what features you had access to were roughly similar. There was a few things in the pro plan that were not on grow and vice versa. We want to unify that into a single plan. And so the only thing you need to uh, uh, think about is how many events are you tracking and number of uh, seats at, at the organization, everything else, all feature included on the growth plan. So you don't have to think about what tier you're on from a, a feature standpoint. And when I look at a pricing and packaging system, I usually like to look at around two different value metrics. Because if you do one, and only one value metric, then a lot of times you can't capture enough value because you're going to have very different customers in different industries with different requirements. 
But if you get to like, say, five different things you're pricing on, you're pricing on features, you're pricing on maybe it's seats, maybe it's something else and then something else. It's just too complex. And now people have to have these complex grids and graphs and, 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 and comparison charts to even figure out like, where do I even sit within the pricing model? And so we want to simplify it. So which is why we only pick two things to price on. And the other thing that we were looking at is how do we make sure that first time team experience was ha, provided enough value and got them to that aha moment as quick as possible. And a lot of SaaS tools, you know, that are more consumer focused, they think about that first time user experience, right? So if you are looking at Spotify, you're looking at maybe something like Notion, which is much more consumer facing, you know, it's really about that single person initially, but for a lot of developer tools and cloud infrastructure, it's really about that team, you know, uh, aha moment. And so when we looked at, you know, how many different team members were involved, how did they expand with most of, how did they grow their requirements and, and uh, continue to grow, um, you know, the, their uh, value that they received from most of, we wanted to optimize around the team level. And by doing so, what we did was we actually took a lot of the features that were already on our pro and moved them on our, our, our very, very uh, intro level pricing, right? And so now you can get started with a growth plan, which is only 60 bucks a month, and you get a full year of data retention. And, and for you know, anyone that's looked at analytics or, or, or logs or anything like that, a lot of times you only get maybe it's three days worth of data, or maybe it's three months. Previously for us, we had three months of you know, data retention for our initial tier. Now it's a full year. So you can actually get the full value of most of which is tracking month over month trends, quarter over quarter trends, especially for, you know, your product team, your finance team, anyone that actually needs to get this data, they feel that they can actually use that to the full value, even if the volume itself is smaller, which is okay. Because not every, you know, product is going to be high volume on day one when they ship. I really like that aspect of it, because in the end, you know, to me, that sounds a lot like in the end, it's really API product management to me, right? You, you think about what is the value that we're delivering and what, not just what is the value, but also what do we think customers need to experience that they understand the value that we're delivering, right? That you're not delivering an experience where, as you said, right, like people might try it out, but they don't really see kind of the most interesting things. And then they would have to invest much more into the product before they even start seeing those things. So I think that that trajectory is really very interesting, right? To really think about how can we demonstrate value and how do we find that balance that we demonstrate value as quickly as we can to customers so that they are incentivized to to um, basically invest more into the platform, right? And say, we like that, we like that tool, we like the team that, that works with it, and then they kind of can ramp up their usage. It is, in fact, you know, when we look at pricing, you know, impacts almost every function of the company these days, you know, from finance team to product and engineering, you know, previously, you know, five or 10 years ago, when you just had your typical SaaS license-based model, you know, pricing was maybe mostly a, a finance concern. But these days with these uses based components, how do you embed it in a, a PLG or bottoms up motion, you know, it really impacts product engineering because, you know, it's not easy to build, you know, all this uses based pricing and metering and all that stuff. I mean, initially we had to build that ourselves. Um, luckily, now we actually provide that as a service. So it's kind of a little meta where, you know, we can use most for it. But, yep. But, um, you know, the other thing we we're looking at was the number of team members. Right. So we did a lot of analysis of you know, what was the right sweet spot that people got the most value out of Mosev? And we saw that initially, you know, as soon as you got to around four or five team members, that was really when you started accelerating, you know, your, your value and your, your um, growth of Mosev itself. And so we actually upped the seat count on our smallest plan from three to five because of that reason. Yeah, again, right? It's it's like this kind of like your assumption is okay, right? We want we want a team to experience that and and we think that 5 is probably a better number than 3, right? And then you provide that. So so that's kind of your minimum like even the lowest tier plan now starts with 5 seats. 
It does. It does. And we see that as, you know, a big improvement for ensuring people get to that team level experience as quick as possible. Um, and then, you know, as they need to grow, they just either need to add one seat at a time or they can, you know, up commit their commitment level. Um, they can do it right within the product now, which is very different than before, where you know, might have to talk to, um, you know, someone from our, our, our team, especially once they're beyond that initial pro plan. Now they can actually commit to a pretty high amount, get those discounts without ever talking to sales. It's, it's all done through credit card and, and self-service. Just like, you know, you look at AWS or Azure, same thing. Okay. I think that's a really interesting story. I like it a lot. I think it's something where, and I'm sure, you know, not, not criticizing your, um, your pricing plan right now, but I'm sure like two, three, four years from now, you will probably tweak it again a little bit, right? I'm guess I'm guessing that's probably normal that you learn and then you adjust. I'm sure. I mean, definitely like, you know, pricing, it's always evolving over time. You know, there's never a, a set pricing model. Um, the thing to be careful about is, you know, how do you manage, you know, existing customers, you know, so they're not impacted. For us, we grandfathered all of our existing customers. So, you know, if they like the old pricing better and it fits their, their use case better, they're free to keep it as long as they keep their plan active. Um, you know, but, you know, we also have have seen some folks move to new pricing model because it just meets their needs better. Maybe they're not ready for the pro plan, but they really needed that one feature that was only available on pro. Now they can get that with our, our smallest plan. And so we have seen a few folks do that. And, and that's why we, you know, we shared it right on our blog. We've been, you know, discussing with customers and it's really up to them, you know, to, to, to see if they like it better or not. Okay, great. I, th I really think that's a cool story. So we'll link to um, that blog article from the description here. We also, you, you, you published a, like a report about like pricing things like a little while ago, right? We did. So we published the O'Reilly report, which walks through um, pricing strategy, you know, uh, metrics for APIs, and really how do you make sure whatever it is that you're building and measuring is aligned to customer value. Um, an example I like to give for that is, you know, let's say you're building a, um, it's a, a email marketing tool. It's an email API, right? And there's really two different things you could charge on. There could be number of email templates stored in the tool. And the value received from this email API would be for a customer trying to reach new people. Maybe it's to generate leads, maybe it's to reach to uh, existing customers. Somehow they want to reach to, to folks because that's what you use email for or email API. But if a customer signs up, they store 100 HTML templates in this platform, but they never ever send a single email, they receive zero value. So why would you charge on number of templates stored in the platform? Instead, a better metric to charge on might be number of emails sent, maybe it's number of distinct different contacts that received the email. Because that's much better aligned to what, if I was a customer of this email API, what do I get out of it? You know, I want to reach more people. I want to email more people. Yeah, no, totally agree. I think it really is. You have to, you have to really think about, you know, like why would people use your thing and then exactly. make sure that you really kind of hone in on that. Okay. We'll link to all these resources um, down in the description below. And um, well, with that, I think we're done for today. Thanks, Derek. Uh, it was really Nice of you to join. Thanks for the discussion. Thanks a lot, Eric. Uh, always happy to be here. Okay, I will, I'll probably have you back at some point, but um, <laughs> we're done for today. So uh, thanks again, and thanks everybody for watching. If you liked it, please give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing, and with that, we are done for today. Keep getting APIs to work. Until next time, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.